February 21, 2022. I am Briggs Simmons, the Planning and Zoning Chair. Prior to this meeting, invitations were sent to join the meeting to all board members, staff, applicants participating in the meeting. All participants will automatically be on mute at the start of the meeting and will need to manually unmute your microphone in order to speak. And remember to place yourself back on mute once you have finished speaking to minimize background noise in the meeting. Members of the Planning and Zoning Board present tonight are Vice Chairman Teresa Knowles. Would you please present. answer? Present. Brandon Penniman. Present. Thank you. Rob Thomas. Present. Oric Curry. Present. Frank Payne. Present. Kirk Nicholson. Present. Thank you very much. We have a quorum with Planning and Zoning Board. Mr. Ron Roberts, our Planning and Zoning Manager, will introduce county staff and Planning and Zoning staff present in the meeting. Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm flipping through here real quick. I, I, I don't see our county attorney, Michael Coleman, on. Is there anybody representing the uh, county attorney? If not, then we have... Um, uh, development service, community development services director of planning James Worthington. We also have the transportation director M Miguel Valentin, zoning administrator Phil Schaefer, senior planner Allison Duncan, and the clerk of the planning and zoning board Johanna Womack on. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Roberts. Uh, tonight's procedures are I will conduct a public hearing on during this meeting. Mr. Roberts will announce each application followed by planning and zoning staff who will present each application in full. Then either the applicant or the applicant's representative may present their request. Following that, members of the public in favor of the application will have a total of 15 minutes to speak on behalf of the application. I'm sorry, the applicant will have 15 minutes to speak on behalf of the application. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of the application or opposed to the application will have three minutes per person for a total allocated of 30 minutes in favor and 30 minutes in opposition. At that point, the staff will clarify any points of the case that the Planning and Zoning Board needs. If the staff is unable to satisfy the board's questions, the board will then ask the applicant for points of clarification. And this is not a time for the applicant to represent their case. Planning and Zoning Board following that will entertain a motion. First thing we have on our agenda tonight is the approval of the September the 20th, 2021 variance meeting. Does any planning and zoning member have any comments, questions or changes? Hearing none, Planning and Zoning Board, do I have a motion? This is Frank Payne. I uh, make a motion to approve minutes from the September 20th, 2021 meeting. Thank, Nichols, you. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion, Planning and Zoning Board? Hearing no discussion, I will call for a vote. As I call your name, please answer in the affirmative or the negative. Mr. Nicholson. Mr. Nicholson, you're on mute. Approve. Mr. Payne. Yay. Mr. Curry. Yay. Mr. Thomas. Approved. Uh, Mr. Penniman. Yay. Ms. Knowles. Yay. Thank you very much. We have a unanimous approval of the minutes of the 20, September 20th, 2021 variance meeting. Uh, Mr. Roberts, would you introduce our first agenda item, please? Um, our first. Yes. Excuse me, yes. Mr. Chairman. Um, our, our clerk has been on the phone with the um, Cosby's. Um, trying to get them access. So um, I believe she is working on it, but I don't believe they're yet on the call. 
So just a, just a point of clarification there. If you would like to either do the presentation first or Ms. Darnell first, um, our clerk is working to get um, the Zoom access to the Cosby's. Okay, uh, let's let's do the Darnells first, V2022-03. Uh, Mr. Roberts. Got it. Z2022-03, Ann Darnell, 4150 James Street in Land Lot 89, District 1, Section 5, Parcel 24. The request is to reduce the front sides, front yard setbacks from 100 feet to a minimum of 25 feet, maximum height limits from 12 feet to 15 feet for an accessory storage unit. It's on point, point 0.46 acres, RLD. The staff recommendation is for approval with conditions, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. I believe, uh, Mr. Schaefer, this is your uh, case. If you would make a presentation now, please. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. So Andor comes before us asking for a little bit of a variance on a property that is really quite constrained. Uh, the property is on the east side of James Street, south of Charlie Lane, and just north of Tackett. It's developed with a single-family residence, has paved driveway, has a uh, side yard um, and, and backyard already fenced and and what we're facing here is a property that actually has three street frontages and placing uh, an accessory structure in anywhere closer than 100 feet of the, the property line on a front is forbidden in the code. And so what, I, what we've asked for here is to be allowed to have the accessory structure meet the setback off of James. And I'll show you, here's the zoning map for it. Uh, her property is right here. It's zoned RLD. Um, she's proposing to uh, place the, the structure here at the south end of the house. It should meet the same setback as the house facade from James Street, which is 30 feet. And that is, in fact, the required setback on the, the recorded plat for the property. However, at Tackett, there's a little bit of um, a problem. It pops out of as you can see, this dashed line is the building envelope. So when you look at this dashed line, the building envelope passes through the proposed site. Um, the building envelope runs up the front facade of the house facing James. And so in measuring it uh, on our GIS system, it looks to me when we decide on the site, it'll be 30 feet from James, but it could be approximately 27 to 25 feet from Tackett, depending on the final separation of the structure from the house. And we propose seven and a half feet separation between the two structures to meet fire code. Um, and that's the site plan for where it's located. In addition, when you look over here, um, the property drops off in elevation from north to south. So the south side of the house is a little lower uh, in the property than the north side. And so on the south side, there is in fact a crawl space under the house. So when you place this structure at the, at the uh, chosen location, the height of the structure is about 15 feet, but the height of the house is 22 feet. So rough proportionality, the proposed storage building is still um, proportional to the height of the house, but it doesn't exceed the house uh, by any uh, imagination. It's still quite a bit lower than the roof line of the house. And so staff felt that given the site plan has three si uh, front yards and one side yard, the side yard's already taken up with a yard that's fenced. And when you look over here on the right, you see the septic tank coming out of the house and then the field lines running down through that backyard. It wasn't possible to locate this structure in this side yard on the right hand. And we certainly don't want it located over the septic field lines. And so the only legitimate place it could go is approximately where she's showing it on the site plan. Uh, in terms of the Platt, this is a, a kind of a very muddle, muddy look at the originally recorded plat from 1977, but you can see that the house setback lines were established on this original plat as 30 feet in from the front property lines. Um, that's what's constraining her. And then when you look at the overall site for, uh, in context of the street network, you can see there, it's a little harder to see here, but there are a number of other accessory structures on many of these properties inside and rear yards. So this is not an unusual request. It's just difficult to cite it. Uh, staff is recommending 
that uh, approval based on the analysis. The analysis for the site showed that it does in fact meet all of the requirements for the development code. And we would recommend approval with the finding that the special exception variance meets the required step back standards for approval. The granting of the variance will not adversely affect the public health, safety or welfare. And the only condition is that the variances granted are to provide for a minimum front yard setback of 30 feet along James Street and 25 feet along Tackett Road, along with a maximum height of 15 feet for an accessory storage building. And with that, I, I believe Ms. Darnell's on, on the line to be able to uh, talk with us about her application this evening. And that concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, Ms. Darnell, uh, or your representative, uh, if you would like to make a presentation to the board, uh, unmute your system, state your name and address for the record, and uh, make any comments that you would like. You have up to 15 minutes. Well, thank you, sir. Um, I'm Ann Darnell. Uh, nice to meet everybody. Um, I do believe that Phil covered everything that we discussed um, you know, appropriately. Um, I'm, the reason why I would like this addition uh, to the to my property is, you know, so that way I can, you know, have a little workstation. Because most of my house is residential, I don't have any any room to, you know, to work in. So um, <laughs> I am a, a hands-on person. Like to like to do little projects and stuff. Um, but uh, my house is uh, is fully you know, paid for. So I plan on being on this property for quite a long time. Um, so anything that I would do with, uh, with this property is to like to enhance the property and enhance the value of, you know, uh, my neighbor's property too in the future. So is there any questions for me or I've never done this before. This is my first time. I'm <laughs> nervous. I'm sorry. That, that's okay, Ms. Darnell. You're doing you're doing wonderful there. Uh, no problem at all. If you would just stand by, I will open the public hearing on this matter, close the public hearing, and then if there are any questions of planning and zoning board, we will uh, call you back in. Okay, thank you. All right, let's open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of this application, please unmute your system, state your name and address for the record. You would have three minutes per speaker for a total allocated time of 30 minutes. Anyone wishing to speak in favor, go ahead. Hearing none and seeing no one trying to uh, access the system, I will now ask anyone wishing to speak in opposition to this application, please unmute your system, state your name and address for the record, you would have three minutes per speaker for a total allocated of 15 minutes, uh, 30 minutes, I'm sorry. Uh, anyone wishing to speak in opposition, unmute your system and go ahead. Hearing no one or seeing no one trying to access the system, I will close the public hearing on this matter. Planning and Zoning Board, do you have any questions for Mr. Schaefer or Ms. Darnell? This is Frank Payne. I just have one question uh, for Ms. Ms. Darnell. Uh, Ms. Darnell, are you in agreement with the uh, findings and the conditions uh, pertaining to this project? Um, yes, sir. I am. Okay, that's that's my only question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. Uh, anyone else having a question for Ms. Darnell or Mr. Schaefer? Hearing none, Planning and Zoning Board, I would ask for a motion, please. Planning and Zoning Board, do I have a motion? This is Frank Payne. Uh, I make a motion to approve application B2022-03, a request to reduce the front yard uh, setback from 100 feet to a minimum of 25 feet and increase uh, maximum height limits 
from 12 feet to 15 feet for an accessory storage structure with the following findings and conditions as read by uh, staff. This is Rob Thomas, I second it. I have a motion and I have a second. Do I have any discussion flagging and zoning board? <clears throat> Hearing none, I will call for a vote on the motion. All that wishing to vote for the motion, please respond with a yay. Anyone wishing to oppose? Nay. Ms. Knowles. Yay. Mr. Curry. Yay. Mr. Peniman. Yay. Mr. Thomas. Yay. Mr. Payne. Yay. Mr. Nicholson. Yay. Thank you very much, Chairman Yay. Class is uh, unanimously. Uh, Ms. Darnell, we wish you the best going forward with this. Uh, that, that's pretty much it for you tonight. Well, thank you, everyone, for your support. I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. You're more than welcome, and we wish you the best. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Uh, is uh, are the Cosby's on yet? Uh, I'm not seeing them yet. Um, I believe there was a phone number, Ms. Mrs. Cosby. We, we're here. You're, you're, great. Thank oh, you. Oh, great. Okay. All right. Great. Mr. Roberts, would you introduce the uh, yes, B-2022-02 for us, please? Yes, sir, I will. B-2022-02, B Eliza and Jerry Cosby at 4241 Giles Road in Landlot 820, District 18, Section 2, Parcel 35. The request, Chairman, is to reduce the front step back from 100 feet to 70 feet to construct a detached accessory garage on an existing parking area. It's the uh, 0.97 acres. Uh, the recommendation from staff is for approval. It's also Phil Schaefer's case. Thank you very much. Mr. Schaefer, would you uh, give us the uh, staff findings and recommendations, please? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so this evening, Ms. Mrs. Cosby come before us. They're asking to be allowed to build a, a accessory garage cr on top of what has been a parking area uh, for some time now. The property is located on the south side of North Giles Road. The site's developed with a single family residence and, uh, and driveway. And the parking area they're looking at is also a fenced parking area. Um, the property is cleared as, as most of it's now yard area. What we're looking at is residential low density as, as far as the zoning is concerned. Let me show you the aerial because this is the, the critical part. So the existing parking area for their RV is right here off of the main driveway as you come into the house. And they're asking to be allowed to use this same area for uh, the detached garage. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that it's a 70 feet from the front property line as opposed to the 100 that's required under the code. But if you start to move this area, it becomes uh, quite a lot of extra work. And then you run into the septic fields and you run into the, the back of the property. There's a structure there already. And so they're just asking if they could please use the existing pad that's there and build a, a garage across this existing area. Um, the actual criteria for the site are all met um, as far as it's concerned. When you look at the aerial, although it's a little hard to see from this elevation, there are a number of other properties around them that have the same issue. They have accessory detached garages, accessory detached storage buildings. So this is not an unusual request. It's similar to what's already there in their neighborhood. The uh, approach to the property here as you can see, uh, North Giles Road, as it goes up towards their property, is a gravel road and a gravel entry driveway. As far as uh, getting into the property, it does go up in elevation from the road to into the uh, property itself. As I mentioned, the ex special exception variance criteria are all met, and we are recommending approval of the special exception variance with the following findings only that the special exception variance meets the required standards for approval and the granting of the special exception variance will not adversely affect the public health, safety, or welfare. And with that, I will conclude my presentation. If you have any questions for me or wish to have any questions um, as we now see, Mr. and Mrs. Cosby are on the phone, which is exciting. Actually, wow. we got them hooked in. <laughs> That's good. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, 
Well, uh, Mr. and Ms. Cosby, please state your name and address for the record and make any comments that you would like for the board to hear. You would have 15 minutes maximum. Uh, hi, this is Elizabeth Cosby, um, 4241 North Giles Road, Douglasville. Um, we would just appreciate approval on this. Thank you. All right, let's open the public hearing. Be sure if you're speaking, state your name and address for the record prior to starting. Hearing none and seeing none and having none on my uh, paper that we we're planning on speaking. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to this application, please unmute your system, state your name and address for the record. You would have three minutes per person for a total allocated time of 30 minutes. Uh, go ahead. Again, hearing or seeing none, I will close the public hearing on this matter and ask the Planning and Zoning Board, do you have any questions for Mr. Schaefer or Ms. Cosby? Or Mr. Cosby? <laughs> Hearing none, Planning and Zoning Board, I would ask for a motion on this matter, please. This is Brandon Penniman. I make a motion to approve application V 2022 dash zero two a request to reduce the front setback from 100 feet to 70 feet um to construct a detached accessory garage on the existing parking area following condition that's ready and by staff thank you very much that's for just findings right not conditions uh, yes, i have a motion do i have a second second and that is Curry. Curry. all right thank you very much i have a motion and a second Planning and Zoning Board, do I have any discussion? Hearing no discussion, I will call for a vote on the matter. As I call your name, please vote in the affirmative or the negative to approve or deny the motion. Uh, Ms. Knowles. Yay. Mr. Curry. Mr. Curry. He's on mute. I'm Yay. Back. Yay. Yay, I'm here. Sorry. Thank you. Mr. Pendleman. Yay. Mr. Thomas. Yay. Mr. Payne. Yay. Mr. Nicholson. Yay. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Yay also. That motion carries unanimously. Mr. Ms. Cosby, we wish you the best going forward with this and good luck with uh, building that on your property there. Thank you. Have a good evening. You are Thank welcome. You, Mr. Roberts, would you introduce the uh, last agenda item, please? The last agenda item is something we're very proud to bring forward. Um, it was a, a, a community development assistance program grant that we applied for, uh, and, and Georgia Conservancy has bringing forward their findings. Um, Allison Duncan has done an exemplary amount of work on getting these stakeholders together, and there's several on the line tonight. And so we wanted to do a brief presentation and I will, I, I, that's it. I'm queuing it up for her because she is an excellent speaker. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Roberts. And uh, well, we're introducing everyone. Uh, Lubin, do you want to see if you can share your screen or if I need to give you any other permissions? Um, uh, and well, Lubin is, uh, here we go. Well, he is getting his screen set up. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you to all of the community members who have joined us um, for the meeting and to all of those folks who are watching um, online through our various social media outlets. As Ron said, this has been an exciting project for us to work on. Um, this has been a partnership with the Atlanta Regional Commission and the Georgia Conservancy through their Community Development Assistance Program. Um, we asked for some technical assistance to take a look at the Lithia Springs area of Douglas County um, and give us some ideas about some good creative placemaking opportunities um, in Lithia Springs. But I think also give us some ideas um, for lessons that we could apply countywide. Um, and so I'm very excited to have um, several folks from the Georgia Conservancy here with us this evening. If you're not familiar with the Georgia Conservancy, um, it's an organization that was founded in 1967 with a statewide focus on the connection uh, between the environment, uh, the economy and equity. Um, they have a portfolio of community planning experiences 
that I think share not just really good ideas from communities around the state, but I think more importantly, they have figured out how these communities have made these ideas happen. So that was of specific importance to us as we asked for them to share best practices that we could um, deploy here in Douglas County. Um, so Catherine Moore, I believe, is on the call with us tonight. Catherine is the president of Georgia Conservancy. Um, she has been working in the fields of community development and environmental planning for over 20 years. Um, we've worked on a number of projects together over the years, and so I'm very glad to have um, Catherine here with us tonight. And before I introduce the rest of the team, I just want to give Catherine a minute to say any words of welcome um, that she may have to share or not. I'm kind of putting her on the spot so she may not realize that I was going to give her that <laughs> opportunity. <sighs> No, Allison, good evening, everyone. I will turn on my video and uh, warn you that I may not have everything positioned right. I'm on my teeny tiny phone versus a laptop, and that doesn't always allow for the best uh, screenshot on Zoom. But um, good evening, everyone. I would simply like to thank um, Allison and um, Ron for their trust in our organization and the invitation to be part of this team. And I would like to thank the Atlanta Regional Commission for also having faith in the Georgia Conservancy and allowing us to be one of the technical partners that they do often refer um, their city and county partners to. So it is just simply our honor to be here. I'm so proud of what our team has put together. And Allison, you are welcome to do the Georgia Conservancy intro anytime. Thank you, ma'am. That was lovely. And we'll hand it off to the folks who really know what they're doing, uh, which, are, which is Mr. Rachev here that's going to do the presentation. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm also very pleased to introduce Nick Johnson. Um, one of the things that gave me faith in this project is knowing if we were awarded the technical assistance that I would be working not only with Catherine, but Nick. Um, Nick is someone I've known for a number of years um, through his career at Georgia Tech, as well as his work with the Georgia Conservancy. He's a senior planner with the Georgia Conservancy, and he works from the Sustainable Growth Team. He's got a broad background of experience, including economic development, environmental resource preservation, uh, housing uh, equity issues, and he has brought all of that expertise to bear as he's been working uh, with Lubin Rachef, who uh, is new to the Georgia Conservancy. This is the first time I've had the opportunity to work with him, um, but Lubin brings his expertise in uh, community planning and urban design, and I think you'll see some of his great work towards the end of the presentation where he's actually taken some of the ideas that we're going to talk about here in the beginning that they've seen in other communities and he's actually applied them to give us some ideas to spark our imagination about how they could work um, here in Lithia Springs um, as well as some ideas for Douglas County overall. So I'm going to stop talking um, and turn it over to Lubin. I've asked them to share about 20 minutes of what is a much longer presentation that's actually going to be posted on our website tomorrow. Um, this was originally envisioned as sort of an in-person community training kind of hands-on workshop. We know because of the uh, COVID virus, we've had to pivot a little bit. Um, so we're doing a brief presentation for the community here this evening. There's going to be a longer pre-recorded presentation that will be available on our website tomorrow. And then we hope as we move in uh, to the year, hopefully the, the virus impact will lessen and then we'll be able to actually get out into the community and offer some, some tours and talk about some opportunities that Lubin will allude to in our presentation. Um, so I'm going to pause right there and turn it over to Lubin. Um, but again, thank you to everybody in the community and all of our leadership uh, who have joined us on our call here this evening. Thanks so much, Allison. And it's been a pleasure to work with you all. It's been a pleasure to work with Allison and Ron. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present. And there are some folks here uh, who I spoke to at the end of last year earlier on in this project. Um, thank you for letting me interview you and letting me in to your community um, to see what your concerns were and what your thoughts were. So like Allison mentioned, um, we'll talk a little bit about um, Lithia Springs and uh, community development training and placemaking that could go on there. I'll just share my screen as a full screen. Um, but these lessons can be applied anywhere. So no need to go through the table of contents. I'll sort of introduce these topics as we run through them. But the first one is going to be civic branding and the role of public art. Um, when I say civic branding, I sort of mean, you know, marketing for your community, um, getting that symbol or slogan or theme, getting it out there in the physical space of your community, in this case, Lithia Springs, so that people know that they are, in fact, there. They're in Lithia Springs. Uh, they can look to something that tells them um, they are so. A lot of uh, communities choose to do this through signage, um, 
through larger or smaller uh, community signs uh, and flags and banners and that sort of stuff. Here's some examples of neighborhoods in Atlanta, like Virginia Highlands and Kirkwood that have invested in signage. Um, it could also be applied to districts or it could be paired with maps like in Roswell. All sorts of ideas here. And if it's a smaller town uh, as well, it, some towns have like welcome signage at their gateway entrances to the whole town. So it doesn't have to be just about the uh, district or the neighborhood. On a smaller scale within residential neighborhoods, some places have developed a unique design that showcases a symbol or a motto or a slogan um, where property owners take, take this and in the form of a flag, hang it off their property. And it's sort of a, a symbol of coalescence between the community and a sen gives a sense of unity to the property owners in the neighborhood. This is a good idea to apply, um, especially in, you know, residential neighborhoods that have been along, um, around for a long time, maybe that people refer to by name and can say, oh, I'm, I'm a part of this community and there's some history there to celebrate. Uh, incorporating that and turning it into a flag or a unique design is a way to even enhance the, the residential community further. Uh, banners are the last thing I'll go through uh, in this sort of print material um, trio um, of civic branding. A lot of places also use uh, banners to advertise events as welcome signage, which we've already covered, as wayfinding signage. There's all sorts of thing that, things that banners can uh, help you accomplish as a community, and they could be hung off from anywhere. Even though you see all of these hung from light fixtures, you don't have to have light fixtures on your street. Uh, to implement these banners, they could hang off the sides of buildings, they can hang off of uh, very uh, generic utility poles or trees or anything. Related to that, um, but a little bit different, is the role of art in the public space. Um, obviously, there is an element of artistry in creating these unique branding designs that we just went through. But there's also another element of art for uh, art for its own sake um, here and art that can be implemented in, in other ways uh, that's not civic branding. A lot of times this is done through murals, uh, paint anywhere, you know, like on fire hydrants or utility boxes or on staircases or just about anywhere. And there's a there's a system of levels that I like to refer to when implementing um, art, you know, in public space. It's not always. Um, done at the same level when we talk about art. So you can have like a blank wall where you have no art at all. You could have art that makes a space more lively and spectacular, or you could have um, art where it's used to serve an additional function. That could be welcome signage, or it could be some sort of uh, meaningful design, something meaningful to community, like it's something about its history. Uh, or background that is incorporated into the artwork. And this is sort of the third level where art um, is not only beautiful, but serves a function for your community as well. Here are some examples of what I mean by that. Um, murals that have achieved that third level. I'll just point to the one here on the bottom left with Hogansville. Um, they have their mural there. It's not, uh, you know, the newest or the most spectacular mural, but it does a really good job of of being a welcome sign, incorporating a hummingbird, which is their uh, symbol for the city. And you'll see how they've used it throughout their civic branding a little bit later on in a few slides. And there are these vignettes of, um, of rural scenes, you know, speaking to their heritage and their uh, the rural character that's still there uh, in Hogansville in some places, outside of the downtown, of course. There's all kinds of ways that uh, places all around Georgia have incorporated art. Um, this is from a combination of Noon and LaGrange, Hapeville, places in Atlanta, Decatur. Uh, and like I said, it could just go anywhere from utility boxes to the fronts of buildings, to the sides, to staircases and pedestrian bridges. Other places incorporate art in the form of sculpture or physical elements. If you've been to Albany, you might have seen their turtles. If you've been to Athens, then you've definitely run across the uh, Athens Bulldogs. 
uh, that are each painted in a different way and just sort of pop up throughout the city. So this is a this is a way to say, oh, you're in Athens, something unique to Athens, you know, and to celebrate the place. Uh, something a little bit more unique um, that branches away from from sculpture design is Lagrange. I really love this example. They've taken an old millstone and displayed it downtown. So when you walk across this, you you uh, learn about a little bit about Lagrange's heritage as a mill settlement. Um, and how cool is that? You know, seeing a millstone in real life. Where do you get to see that other than in a museum? They've actually taken something from the past, which is just a stone. Uh, and incorporated it into their public street design. I'll spend a little bit of time on, on, um, on Hogansville and their hummingbirds because this is one of the few places I'll talk about how civic branding can cross the boundary and go into programming or event programming. So Hogansville has something they call the Hummingbird Festival. Um, the hummingbird is their symbol, like I mentioned. This festival started in 1998. It was going to be a one-time thing, um, but it turned into an event that's repeated every year. All of the money goes to something called the Hogansville Charitable Trust, and this is sort of the arm that takes the money and uses it to fund improvements in and around downtown Hogansville. And so far, I think the festival has raised, raised over $300,000 throughout the years. Uh, they've used that money to leverage even more funding, about $3 million, by uh, receiving matching funds from federal, state, and other grants with the money that they were able to raise. So it's been really successful. If you go to their site, hummingbirdfestival.com, you can even see another form of, of uh, civic promotion in, in their video, which they've done this really great shot um, where I think the mayor speaks and there's drone footage flying over Hogansville and it's really beautiful and it's sort of an advert, you know, for the city. Here's a photo of what the Hummingbird Festival looks like and other ways that they've incorporated the Hummingbird, both in sculptures and in that banner signage, which you already had a glimpse at before. Um, and that was it on civic art, uh, or civic branding and the role of public art. We'll move on a little bit uh, and talk a little bit about more specifically about placemaking. So placemaking is this idea of taking a space that is uh, indistinct in a way, it could be a space that's anywhere and turning it to a place that's somewhere, something that people can point to and maybe have a name for and say, oh, meet me there or let's go there and hang out. Um, and it's on a smaller scale than something like a park or a civic center. It's sort of taking those underutilized spaces and making something more of them. There's an organization called the Project for Public Spaces that has done a lot of work around the uh, concept of placemaking. So if you want to find out more, definitely give their site a look. Uh, it's pps.org. Some of the information on this slide comes from them. For example, they have these four metrics um, by which they assess places um, of placemaking projects. One of them is, does it have uses and activities that people can engage in? Is it comfortable? Does it look nice? Does it promote uh, social activity? Uh, is it a social place? And also, is it accessible? So are there connections there that allow people to reach it? And is the uh, space public? Um, not quasi-public, but public um, in, in full so that people are sure they have the right to be there and feel like they can be there. That's an important factor. Um, the best candidates um, for placemaking projects are those that are fully public, just so people feel welcome and they know they're welcome, but they can be quasi-public spaces as well. And the other key thing that I want to point out is that these projects don't have to be expensive. They could be as low of a lift as putting a few uh, chairs and tables out. So it could be something that's lighter, quicker, and cheaper, and not something that takes several years, you know, to implement. Um, this is a lot in LaGrange, in downtown LaGrange. It was always a lawn, uh, but at some point there was another building that was attached to this downtown building. It got knocked down. And then the park, or the pocket park, I should say, expanded a little bit. So in terms of what it takes to maintain, I mean, it's relatively low maintenance. Someone has to come and mow the lawn. Uh, there are a few tables there on the corner, a tree and uh, umbrellas for shade. And it's just a nice place to sit and relax as you're shopping downtown. Of course, it helps if people are already coming to the place, like if it is your downtown, then adding this extra 
um, a place to go to that you've created through your placemaking project is an added bonus. It's an insurance that it will get used in a sense. Another example, here's a pocket park in a neighborhood in Smyrna. Um, this is a great use of an oddly shaped in a small lot that wouldn't typically get looked at for a building project. Uh, it could have just remained a vacant lot, but the community and the city of Smyrna have invested in this and created a nice little pocket park that the neighbors can come and sit at and relax and also use maybe to host neighborhood events. One of my favorite examples is from Marietta, downtown Marietta. There's uh, in the historic uh, block structure there, they have some alleys. So that's a little bit of additional public space that some places have those alleys. But those alleys lead to the backs of buildings that you know aren't necessarily the place where people will go. Um, what's happened here in this case is the city has has bought this lot or they owned it prior beforehand anyway and they took uh the energy and resources to put into this area and invested in it and created a really nice place to just sit and hang out downtown i thought for the longest time that it belonged to the coffee shop uh cool beans which is right there but it's actually not anything to do with the coffee shop it's a totally publicly owned property that the city paid for um, and that all kinds of people come and hang out at. Usually though, because there is a coffee shop there, uh, it is a lot of coffee shop patrons there enjoying their drinks. Other spaces are in between buildings, you know, in the Grange and Hogansville. These aren't places where maybe you'd go and sit at, but it's still a place for downtown workers to take breaks. And it's doing something a little bit more um, with those overlooked places, uh, making something nicer of them, increasing maybe property values in the area or just improving the image, which is also important. And I'll leave you with this project spotlight in this section. Uh, in downtown Statesboro, uh, there was an alley that was, you know, just used to uh, pick up trash and for loading and unloading. And what happened here was, um, and the Averett Center for the Arts in State applied to for this grant from the Georgia Council for the Arts called the Vibrant Communities Grant. They won the grant, but then they handed it over to the Downtown Statesboro Development Authority to actually execute this project. So the conceptual sketch actually looks um, really close to what the final product turned out as. They really did the most with a little that they had. Um, there's a mural in the back that sort of extends the alley visually. Um, so that's sort of an optical illusion there. Uh, they added that. It also celebrates their sister city, which is in Italy. Um, and they've added a whole bunch of little features like the planters, the trellis, the chairs and the tables, of course, and then some iron artwork on the walls and given it a new paint job, it looks like. So they've made, um, a trash alley into something where people can come and take breaks at. So that was a project spotlight there for placemaking before we move into funding mechanisms and other forms of incentives that can be implemented in Douglas County um, in or outside of Lithia Springs. So we'll talk a little bit about tax incentive based ones, um, tax allocation districts, special tax districts, SPLOS districts. Um, we won't talk about community improvement districts here, but again, this will be in the longer presentation, so please check it out. And then we'll talk about facade improvement grants. First, let's start with the facade improvement grants. This is not a tax-based incentive. Uh, it's a program that's run um, in several places throughout Georgia, like St. Mary's and Madison. They have facade improvement programs. Also around the Beltline in Atlanta. So this program involves um, incentivizing property owners, usually commercial property owners, to fix up their buildings either through a grant that's offered to the property owner, a loan, or in many cases, a uh, reimbursement. Um, a lot of times this does happen through reimbursement, which has a downside. That is if the property owner doesn't have the capital uh, to invest in the improvement outright, then they're not going to do it and then reimbursement won't help, right? So a grant upfront or a loan upfront is better for the property owner to actually uh, engage in this project in some cases. But if the property owner does have the capital to do it anyway, then definitely the reimbursement is helpful. 
Here's an example of what a facade improvement program looks like. These are properties around the belt line. Um, one of them is a bike shop where it just has uh, a new coat of paint. The trim is painted a different way. The building looks overall nicer, um, you know, afterwards, but it's not that much of an investment. And then the second one is installing this series of neon lights that makes this really beautiful facade. Uh, on Red's Beer Garden. So that's a little bit of a more expensive project that this kind of program can fund. It doesn't only have to be uh, applied to commercial properties. Facade improvements can also be applied to residential properties. Just a disclaimer, the middle photo is actually of a, a code enforcement before and after, but still the effect is, is similar. And I'll talk about this code enforcement project uh, a little bit later because it's a great story. Um, the Beltline uh, Facade Improvement Program, to go into it really briefly, uh, it's a pilot project that started in 2019, and they haven't done uh, a follow-up, I think, yet. I'm not sure, but I don't think they've done it because of the pandemic. Um, but I hope they do, because it's a really great program. You saw the two examples, the before and after results. Um, it gives up to $40,000. There's a match that the property owner has to provide. Usually there is some some level of matching that the property owner has to provide. And my favorite part about it is that they pair a local artist with property owner. So it's good for the arts community. It's good for the commercial property owners. And then afterwards, it's good for the neighborhood overall. Now to switch and talk a little bit about this code enforcement um, project that I found so wonderful. Code enforcement is obviously a tool that is common to a lot of communities in Georgia, but it's enforced at different levels between communities. Some communities don't really enforce it that much, um, and some communities enforce it more than others. And there's a sort of um, a better way to do this, you know, and, and a worse way to do this. And I think Gainesville has done this in a really great way. Um, and what I like to point out about them and why I think it's so great is one, they engage everyone from the beginning. They had support from their elected officials, from their city attorney, from the people who actually do the code enforcement. So they had everyone behind them, you know, before they engaged in this. And secondly, they had communication throughout. Communication between the uh, landlords and the tenants, if there were any, um, and between the people actually doing the enforcement. So this allowed them to sort of go into communities. They took everyone on a tour. They took their elected officials on a tour um, to where they wanted to really uh, dig down on their code enforcement practices. They showed everyone what the delinquent properties looked like before they engaged in this process. And then they had their support um, and went into the communities and confronted those landlords and usually it was landlords who were um, responsible for not maintaining their properties more so than uh, homeowners. So just, just something to keep in mind. And with this um, communication throughout and with the support that they build uh, with their elected officials and local government and everyone, everyone behind them, they were able to make wonderful changes in their community. Ultimately, there was only one citation given. And they're still doing this. They're doing a couple of districts, I think two districts a year, of a total of nine. They've done five so far in Gainesville. Hey, Lubin, we have about five more minutes for the time allocated for the presentation. Great. Thank you, Allison. Um, all right. I'll talk a little bit about tax districts. There's one form of tax district called a special tax tax district. This is where you uh, levy funds. Um, property owners agree to levy funds for a specific purpose like infrastructure improvement. This could be water and sewer or road improvements, something like that. Uh, to give you a quick example, Oconee County has a couple of these. They have a little bit of different procedures to establish them, but the effect is the same. Property owners agree to levy a tax upon themselves to then fund these improvements. Uh, the next form of tax district I'll talk about before I move on to the last is a tax allocation district. You guys are familiar with this. There was one in Douglas County. This does not involve levying an additional tax. This involves making improvements and taking the uh, increase in property tax revenue from those improvements and allocating it to a specific purpose for a period of time. And then after that period of time expires, you can either extend the TAD or uh, it just goes away and dissolves. Atlantic Station in Atlanta, which is built on a brownfield, um, was partially funded because of 
uh, tax allocation district. Lastly, I'll talk about SPLOS districts. Instead of a property tax or levying any additional tax, uh, this, um, sorry, levying any additional property tax, this is a sales tax. So this is a 1% sales tax that's established through referendum. It's used to fund public services and public facilities. The Cap County has a uh, great display of what they've done with SPLOS on their site. So I think they're really transparent. Um, source to find examples of uh, SPLOS implementation. And they have this other type of SPLOS, which I found unique to their community. It might exist somewhere else in Georgia as well. But in DeKalb County, there's an equalized homestead option sales tax. The revenue from this sales tax goes towards um, alleviating property taxes for um, pr homeowners that already have homestead exemption. So it's a little bit of a boost um, for uh, to help people with their property taxes. It's something that people have decided to levy taxes for, and uh, it goes back to the homeowner and helps them pay for their property taxes. It's just an added uh, aid for homeowners and communities. These last three sections will be very, very brief. Uh, you already know what a streetscape is, so I don't need to talk at length about that, but um, just your street environment can be very important. Um, to your community and enhancing that image and increasing those property values. So this is a picture of a nice streetscape from Decatur. It has those painted crosswalks, street trees, uh, ample sidewalks for people to walk in. And these types of improvements are something that you can do throughout Douglas County and especially in Lithia Springs um, to just improve the situation over time. Some features that you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about a streetscape is the planting buffer, any landscaping that you need to do, just having those wide sidewalks for people to be able to walk. Um, in this case, they have special pavers on the sidewalk in Powder Springs. So just things to consider. In LaGrange, they have some traffic control measures as well, like this bump out, which sort of narrows the road. It creates this pinch point. It slows down vehicle traffic, so it kind of improves the safety um, for pedestrians and it just, it's less intimidating for pedestrians. So this is an example of improved streetscape that I like to show. In addition, they have those really old street trees, uh, which have obviously been in their downtown for a long time. And those planters that are hanging off their lampposts, which are just really nice, just a form of beautification there. And one thing, if you're considering uh, expanding, you know, bus service, um, like in the Connect Douglas program, um, you just want to invest a little bit also in and think about uh, your transit shelters. So bus transit shelters, just protecting people from the elements are also one part of your streetscape. Missing middle housing and infill development is the last section before we move on to some um, sketches and examples of urban design in Lithia Springs. This is a way for you not to engage in an overall uh, developing a new site, not those big projects, but focusing more on taking a vacant property in your existing communities and maybe making a small development on it or um, renovating um, buildings that already exist to up your housing stock. Uh, like I said, again, without devoting time to those really big projects or, or new subdivision or something like that. So missing middle housing refers to this type of housing that's between single family uh, all the way to mid-rise apartments. So everything from two to let's say 12 units or small apartment buildings with maybe more than 12 units, but still smaller than your, um, your five-story apartment buildings that are popping up everywhere now. Includes duplexes, triplexes, live work units, townhomes, all of that stuff. So to give you examples of what this looks like, uh, here's something that's called a cottage court. It's a bunch of uh, houses that are single family homes, but they're a little bit smaller and they're uh, arranged around a shared space. So this is something that could go in existing single family uh, neighborhoods and it won't be out of character. It will look exactly like it belongs there, but it's a way to up that density just a little bit um, in a beautiful and unassuming way. Duplexes uh, are also a really nice option. They, uh, some communities are afraid of duplexes, but they're starting to be in vogue again. There are actually some examples of new duplexes being built. Here are two examples that are beautiful, one from Porterdale. 
Also, there's a lot of these quadplexes and multi-unit properties that range from like four to eight units all around Atlanta. Um, these are pretty common as well. And lastly, I'll leave you with these uh, examples from Avondale Estates and a small apartment building in Avondale Estates as well that I just found this weekend, so I added them to the presentation. This is where I live. Uh, and these are examples of missing middle that I found in my neighborhood. They're all over, so I bet if you if you go around Douglas County, you'll find examples of these types of buildings already existing. So now this last part of applying these lessons, um, we've taken the time and created this map just to start on uh, brainstorming ideas for where these types of improvements can go uh, in and around Lithia Springs mainly. So not belaboring this point, there won't be time to talk about this now, but uh, this presentation is provided to you and also there is the longer version. So if you wanna find out more, um, please take a look at this map and analyze it, uh, dig into it as much as you'd like. But this is sort of just the starting primer of where you might begin to think about implementing these things. And to get into a little bit more real examples, um, here's something that's very important in Lithia Springs as a symbol. Uh, it's the clock that's near that intersections with uh, Veterans Memorial, I believe, and North and South Sweetwater Roads. Um, taking that clock and reimagining um, how it could be fixed up. So it could be as simple as doing a new paint job, or it could be uh, more than a paint job, but adding that welcome signage next to the clock and making it more visible. Or step three, you know, taking um, the clock, adding welcome signage, and adding a bit of beautiful landscaping uh, and greenery around it to emphasize it as a symbol of Lithia Springs. Around that same area here, I'll leave you with two examples of uh, the downtown node reimagined. So on the bottom left hand corner is what the um, the intersection there um, at, at this downtown sort of node looks like and what it might look like in the future if um, you know, there were investments made in creating sidewalks and enhancing that streetscape environment, adding a mural and just creating all, all of these things come together to um, encourage people to be and live, work and play downtown, you know. Just around the corner, uh, another example, what this might look like if there were sidewalks, if that uh, space in between buildings was improved uh, and maybe given special pavers, maybe some seats and tables for people to sit at. And if those commercial properties had a facelift, um, there was something like a facade improvement program. These are just a few things and ideas to get you started. Um, we really enjoyed thinking of ways to implement these improvements and we'd love to engage again more. But for now, that's it. Again, please check out the longer presentation that will be made available to you tomorrow, like Allison said. Uh, my name is Lubin Rachev. Here's my contact information and also that of my colleague, Nick Johnson, who's on the call. And Catherine Moore is also here with us once again. Thank you. Thank you, Lubin. I appreciate all that information. I have watched the longer presentation, and I definitely think for those of you interested in this topic, um, it is worth spending some time with that. Um, as I said, as pandemic conditions improve, we do hope that we can actually get out in the field, get on a bus and take some tours. Um, and go look at some of these things that Lubin has suggested in person and come up with some other ideas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes our presentation this evening. We'd be more than happy to take any questions or feedback um, from the Planning and Zoning Board. Uh, for members of the public who are on the call, I would definitely welcome your feedback, encourage you to email me or give me a call uh, tomorrow or later this week in the office. Would love to hear your thoughts and talk more um, with anybody about this presentation. So thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that was a, a very interesting presentation there, uh, and we certainly appreciate it. Planning and Zoning Board, do you have any questions at this point in time? Hearing no questions from Planning and Zoning Board, uh, I guess that concludes our uh, meeting for tonight. Uh, Ms. Duncan or Mr. Roberts, is there anything else that we need to cover tonight? Uh, no, Chairman. I just wanted to thank Allison Duncan. I want to thank Georgia Conservancy, um, and I want to thank the the Board of Commissioners for for giving us the opportunity to pursue the Community Development Assistance Program grant. Uh, this this is an uh, exemplary uh, 
presentation. Uh, uh, the, the, like I said, like Allison said, that there there is a longer presentation uh, online, and we look forward to getting past this wicked COVID and, and and taking you guys out and seeing what really is is possible for that community. I I, I see uh, Beth Ayers, Amy McCoy, all these people that were on our our, our stakeholder committee that had done so much work, and I just want to thank them um for, for participating and uh we look forward to uh, uh rolling this work into our comprehensive plan that we're we're pursuing to update by 2023 chairman that's great thank you very much and, and i uh also would ditto everything that you uh said there mr roberts um that uh then concludes our meeting tonight at this point in time we will adjourn the planning and zoning board variance meeting thank everyone for being here Thank, Thank you, you all. Everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Good night.